So today we're going to talk about patient and doctor communication. Some of the issues that occur when patients are in your office um, and how to better improve patient understanding. Um, I think a lot of us are really not cognizant of how health illiteracy is out there in majority of the patients. Really only about 10 to 12 percent of our patients really fully understand what we talk about when we discuss things with them. So what's important about communication? Well, I think the most important thing about communication is that each partner, each part of the team has to listen to one another. I mean, when you look at this first point, um, is this the point? It's not the point. Um, but we're going to make the point that doctors will allow their patients to talk for about six seconds before they interrupt them. What do you learn in six seconds? Not a whole lot. Um, and we also, there was also another study that looks at men and women, and they also behave very differently in their physician's office. Men don't ask, don't ask questions. Women, maybe five or six. Um, but again, why not? Or is there an intimidation? Do they not just understand? Um, and so when we look at good communication skills, why is that important? Because you have to form a trust with your patient. The patient has to trust you. And you likewise have to trust that the patient is going to effectively communicate what's going on with them. Otherwise, it's going to really impact the quality of their care. Um, the more that a patient believes and trusts in you, the easier it's going to be to understand therapies, get patients to be compliant and understand why they're being compliant, maybe participate in a clinical trial because they truly believe that you have their best interest at heart, although we always do, sometimes patients may be leery. And so these are just some of the things that are the good side of good communication. Um, and again, why are we talking about loss in translation? And, and this goes back to what I was talking about, where we as physicians, we're always, you know, we're always on a clock. We're always, you know, we've got a meeting to go to. We've got 27 patients in the waiting room. We'll come in assuming that the nurse practitioner or the physician assistant has already spoken with the patient. So we're going to come in. We're going to say, hey, what's going on? Um, okay, so I, I hear this is going on. That's great. And you're going to essentially regurgitate what the patient told the nurse and never let the patient fill in the blanks. Because sometimes when you do, you find out a whole lot more than what patients reveal to your healthcare providers, um, like your nurse or your PA. It, it wouldn't surprise me at all you know, when I walk in and I say to the patient, so I understand that you've had uh, trouble sleeping. And you know, I'll say to my nurse, well, why? And they'll say, well, they, they, they've, they've just got things going on and they're stressed about their disease. If you give that patient more than about six seconds, I bet you're gonna find out a whole lot more about why they're not sleeping. Are there marital issues because the patient is sick? Um, are they having financial difficulty? Is there a problem with paying for medicine? Um, you know, there are so many different aspects to patient care um, that we as providers really need to acknowledge, um, but we never give them the opportunity. Um, and so these are just some, uh, you're all going to have a copy of these slides, some of the things that we brought out that we found in research that really does inhibit a good patient-doctor communication. Um, and how did we get here? Well, we got here because Fortunately, things are moving very quickly. Um, the world moves very quickly. We don't have time for anything. We don't have time to talk to one another. Um, but I think we need to. We can learn so much. Um, we have this panel here today. I am representing, I think I'm representing the doctor today. Um, I have worn all of these hats. I, you know, I haven't been a patient, but I have been a caregiver. Um, for my husband who had cancer. And so I, I get what it's like to sit on this panel. So I'm gonna wear two hats today. Um, but we have a cancer survivor and we have a patient advocate who took care of their mom with cancer. Um, and so what we're gonna do today is we want this to be a very active, interactive session. 
where we're going to talk about some of the things that were the pros of communication and some of the things that were really cons and really turned us off um, and what we can learn from that and how we can do better. So with that, I am going to move to our discussion to talk a little bit about experiences that we had. Let's start out on the good note. Experiences that we've had that have been very positive with our healthcare providers. And so I'm going to pass that over and let you ladies introduce yourselves. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pavlik. I'm Christina Baum, uh, as Cody mentioned. I am a melanoma survivor right now, as far as we know. Um, <laughs> so I have dealt with melanoma three different times, um, from stage 3A to metastasized to my kidney to brain mets. Um, done two clinical trials. I was a phase one patient on the Optulog trial, so yay phase one patients. Um, that being said, I think, you know, going into a clinical trial specifically, you know, you do need to have robust communication with your medical team. Um, to answer Dr. Pavlik's question, I think some of the good experiences that I've had um, have been just reaching out to my medical team um, when I have side effects. And I know if you're like me and you're not a hypochondriac, you don't want to email your doctor and your nurse when you have just a headache or just kind of a stomach ache or these things that seem so small to you uh, are actually a big deal to them. So if, especially if you're in a clinical trial, this is data that matters to them. So when you're communicating these different side effects, these small things could actually be a big deal. And so it really is in your interest and your benefit to communicate these small things, albeit, like I said, if you're just having a stomach ache or a headache. Uh, for me, for example, um, during the phase one study that I was on, uh, I started having a headache, started getting nauseous, and this went on for three days. And uh, at the time, I did have a stressful job. I was a communications director on Capitol Hill. So if you know anything about our government, no two dates are the same, and it's not very smooth sometimes. <laughs> So that being said, uh, I just kind of attribute this to stress. And sure enough, I went in for treatment on Friday per usual. And at that point, Tylenol wasn't working. Advil wasn't working. Um, I light and sound just felt her. It felt like a really horrible hangover, but no alcohol. So that being said, um, what we learned in that time is that I was having one of those adverse responses called autoimmune meningitis, which is where your immune system recognizes your brain as cancer, and it starts attacking your brain. So, and it's very serious. You can get brain damage from it if you don't act quickly. But fortunately for me, I took initiative to communicate these small symptoms to my medical team and in which case, they were able to manage it. I didn't have permanent damage or anything of that nature. And sure enough, this drug, thank God, went on to go through multiple phases and is now FDA approved. So um, I think that's just one positive that I've had in working with my medical team is just you want to over-communicate, especially if you're in a clinical trial. My name is Nadia. I took care of my mother, uh, whose name was Ursula, um, for about six years before she passed away from melanoma at uh, home with me alone during the pandemic. So I had that experience. Um, and what I really want to do today is share um, what I learned mostly in hindsight that I wish I knew at the time, which was that communications is hard. Um, I didn't know that it was a thing that we all struggle with, whether you're a clinician, a nurse, uh, you know, the admin person who just answers the phone, um, or the patient. I, I just assumed it was my failing that I couldn't ramp up fast enough in six years to memorize every single drug name, or you know, that I wasn't able to advocate for my mother as fast, as not, fast enough as I would have wished for um, that I couldn't negotiate with doctors about why I felt like she needed proteomic molecular testing, uh, and you know, and they would just say no, and I'm like, but why not? And I tried to make a, you know, make a discussion. Oh, really? <laughs> you mic'd me. <laughs> okay, sorry. Should I start from the beginning? <laughs> I knew I'm probably smashing the the microphone with my elbow. Um, 
Anyway, I, I only learned really at the end and afterwards that communications is a skill that patients need to learn. Patients need to basically go to school, uh, cancer school, to learn how to be a patient. Caregivers need to go to a, a caregiver school to learn you know, how to manage their relationship with their loved one now that their loved one has a um, potentially deadly disease um, and how to communicate with not just one clinician that you might get to know over a long period of time, but multiple clinicians, uh, tons of people. Uh, you know, my mother went through different medical systems. Um, I met so many people, I'd have to write down, you know, so many different names. So you're dealing with so many personalities. Um, sometimes, you know, you meet a whole new team at during the last few weeks of your loved one's life. And so it's, it's difficult to communicate in general. And I thought, again, like I, I said when I wasn't mic'd properly, that I thought it was my failing. I didn't realize that that was something that all of us need to deal with. And there should be training and that there are things that you can do. There are resources out there. And that's what I'm hoping that we can discuss more of. Um, and for, for me as a, as a caregiver, from that perspective, some of the unique dynamics that I went through, albeit you know I was a, a child taking care of my elderly mother, that's very different than what a lot of other caregivers maybe out there deal with, but there are some things that are, are similar in terms of um, how best to work with a team and to ask the questions. I mean, here we're, we're dealing with a communications expert who is, you know, maybe sometimes challenged to, t to communicate uh, for, her, for her care. But as a caregiver, you can sometimes ask questions that your loved one is afraid to ask. In the case of my mother, she often, she was the type that didn't want to, um, didn't want to raise, you know, raise a flag when she wasn't feeling well. And we would get to the appointment after having reviewed all of her symptoms, reviewing the notes together, and she would get there and in front of the doctor say, nothing is wrong. I'm fine, I'm fine, because she wanted to be the good patient. And I would have to play the bad cop and say, you are not fine, and this is why, and list all of the things. And she took it as a personal kind of insult as if I was criticizing her by calling her out on all of the symptoms and struggles that she was having that we talked about sharing with the doctor and why we needed to talk about it with the doctor. So sometimes, you know, as a caregiver, you can lift, um, do the heavy lifting sometimes, but, you know, there are also some, um, uh, a burden to that that we can get into. So that's the, that's the positive takeaway, is that there are ways to learn about communication and we all should learn um, what we can to try to communicate better because outcomes and quality of life do depend on that. Oh, and, and to just dovetail on what you said, um, you know, there, there are patients who want to know everything, and including your references including where you went to middle school and what your GPA was. <laughs> um, and then there are the other patients, like your mom, who just don't want to know anything. But the, and, and so as a, as a physician, you know, you, you got to find out what, and it's usually pretty easy to know who wants to know your GPA. Um, What's your GPA, Dr. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, was I supposed to go to medical school? Oh, sorry. Um, but then you have the caregiver, so you've got the patient who doesn't really want to know anything because that's, that's just how they deal. But then you've got the caregiver who comes in on the very first visit, and then you know, you're telling the patient, yes, um, you have melanoma, it's gone to you know, your lungs, this is what our treatment options are. You know, we talk about clinical trials. We talk about, you know, if the patient hasn't been staged, well, then we need to do some, take some pictures. So what's, the, what's, a, what's a PET scan? What's a CAT scan? What's an MRI? I mean, we, we use these terms like we think that everybody knows what they are. Um, Patients may or may not ask you, what's the difference between the MRI and what's the difference between a PET scan and a CAT scan? Um, so I, I like to give patients and their family members the opportunity to tell me what they want to know. 
Um, because if a patient really doesn't want to know, then the patient has the right not to know. If that's how they're going to deal with this, then I have to respect that. Um, but likewise, they've got a family member or a close friend or whoever their caregiver is who has these burning questions because they are going to be taking care of this person. And so one of the things that I usually do at the, at the end of the, my first visit with patients is say, listen, I will answer all your questions, whatever you want to know. However, if there is a question that you as the patient don't want to know the answer to, you need to speak up and tell me, I don't want to know that question. I don't want to know that answer. Because your caregiver may say, and I've had it happen many times, where you know, you've got the patient and they're, they're pretty much the deer in the headlights of, oh my goodness, I have cancer. And that's all they're thinking about is, oh my goodness, I have cancer. And then I've got the caregiver who's already four, four miles down the road, who's on the question of, so what's the prognosis and how long do they have? So again, I, I, I like to put it out there that if a caregiver has those questions, as long as the patient says it's OK for me to talk to the caregiver and give them the information that they want and they need in order to provide the best care for their loved one, I say, OK. At the end of the visit, I say to the patient, well, your daughter, son, uncle, whoever it is, has some questions. If you don't want to be present, why don't you just go have a seat in the waiting room, and I'm going to answer these few questions for them, and then you know we'll, we'll let you go home. But I think it's really important to respect what a patient wants to hear and what they don't want to hear, and also to provide them with information when they're ready to hear it, um, especially how long do I have. Family members always want to know how long somebody's got. Very rarely patients want to know how long they've got. Um, at least not on the first visit, at least not in my experience. As patients get further along in their disease, if they're getting worse and things are not getting better, then I will have a patient say, all right, doc, you know, we've been at this for a while. How long do you think I have? Um, and, and that's when we sit down and we have that serious conversation. Um, as someone who was on the receiving end of getting information I was not prepared for, I actually had my husband's oncologist come up to me, clear out of the blue, and say, you know, he's only got about six months. Like you were telling me, would you like a venti latte at Starbucks? Um, and I, I have to tell you, even though I am in this profession, that's not what I was ready to hear. I was just processing the fact that it was metastatic. I know what metastatic means. I know he's going to die. And I was not ready to know. In my head, as the doctor, I knew that six months. But knowing in your head and then having somebody validate it and hear it makes it real. So I just, I think it's very important that when we provide patients with information, we really make sure that they are ready to hear that information. Um, because maybe because that happened to me, I am now very hypersensitive to that. And I make sure I never blurt out, well, you know, you better get your affairs in order. Um, and sometimes you do, but there are ways to gently approach that topic and unless it's going to be imminent within, you know, it's very rare that you as an oncologist see a patient for the very first time, and that patient is never going to come back and see you again. Has it happened? Yeah. Um, it's happened like three times in my career where my very first visit with somebody was like, holy moly, we have to have that talk. Because this is, you're just entirely too sick. This is too far gone. And we need to get things in order for you and your family. Um, but if you've got somebody who has metastatic disease, I think you need to open up the conversation. But you open it up gently. 
And every time the patient comes back, you can build on that. And so you build that trust and you're able to prepare the patient and the family and not blindside them with some fact. And by the way, they were wrong. It was nine months and six, and it wasn't six months. But as the person who was that caregiver, when six months hits, you look at that calendar and you're like, oh God, it wasn't today. Is it gonna be tomorrow? And every day after that, you think, is it gonna be today? Is it gonna be today? Um, and it's a really crummy way to live because it takes away from the quality time that I was supposed to have as opposed to thinking, is it gonna be today? Um, I don't know if you had any kind of experiences like that, but you know, getting information where you just weren't ready to hear it or not getting information that you should have had. I think I have sort of the opposite because, uh, and, and I think the data show that patients don't find out mostly about end of life until way too late. Uh, and the data also show that patients aren't really informed about their prognosis about end of life in general and are not prepared for end of life and nor are their caregivers. And in my experience, I felt like I had advocated for my mother for so long that when that time came, not only was I oddly surprised and not ready, but I was not prepared at all and didn't know how to do it. And it was too late to learn how to advocate at end of life, because that's a whole different game than advocating during treatment. Um, and so I felt like I really failed as a daughter because I didn't have time to figure this out. And so it was, it's an issue that I've become passionate about since then and want to raise awareness around end of life within the melanoma community so, um, so that we can be better prepared for those of us that want to be prepared. You know, I, and I'm not saying that everybody should be told whatever the clinician wants to tell them. I think it's up to the patients to, like you said, inform the clinician how much they want to know um, and when, and not just once, but over and over. And I think you have to repeatedly tell your clinician I really want to know everything and not just um, what I'm able to ask the questions about because I happen to know the words. If I don't know the words or don't know to ask the questions, I want to know anyway. Like, be proactively informing me. And you, if that's the kind of patient and caregiver that you are, you have to kind of keep reminding your clinician about it because you might not be lucky to get a doctor like Dr. Pavlik who wants to be transparent about prognosis and wants to be transparent also about side effects and believes that you as the patient um, defines what quality of life is and what side effects you want to take on and what side effects you don't. Uh, because patients have options for treatments. Patients um, have options about you know, what to do when, but unless you, you know and advocate for yourself, then you, you won't find out. And if you're the kind of patient that doesn't want to do that work, that's great. But if you're the kind of patient that wants to continue learning and become better at communicating, um, you should have the right to do so and not be blocked by anyone on your care team. Uh, and there are resources out there in the peer-to-peer -peer community to learn how to communicate better, to find out what other doctors are doing. So if you hear Dr. Pavlik talking um, about you know, that she would like to be told by her patients how much they want to know and she'll respect that, then you get the idea, oh wait, just because my doctor doesn't do that doesn't mean that it's not possible because clinicians are not taught uh, in school. You're not taught in medical school, which is shocking. Um, many doctors don't know anything about end of life. They, you know, they say goodbye to the patient. They have no idea what hospice is like. So we're all in this together to, to learn and inform and hopefully have more conversations as equal stakeholders at the table trying to come up with better ways to talk to each other. Yeah, and I'll just say as the, the patient, um, look, I think all of us are in this room because at some point we received news that was not good, right? So um, it's really how you digest that information. I know for myself, <clears throat> you know, when I learned I had brain mets, you know, I straight up asked my oncologist um, if I was dying. And he said, that's a possibility. And it was just like, whoa, 
hold on, kind of exactly what Dr. Pavlik is talking about. And that's really like all you can retain at that moment. Everything else is just like Charlie Brown teacher. And um, I remember I went home that night and I couldn't sleep and it was all I could think about. And, you know, brain mets is not great. I think we all know that. Um, but I think what ended up being really helpful is I had a medical team who was really willing to walk me through everything and answer all my questions. Um, for me, when I was diagnosed with brain mets, unfortunately, I got diagnosed right before Christmas one year. <laughs> um, so, and if you have ever been diagnosed before Christmas, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like you cannot schedule your appointments. Everybody's on holidays. And when you're a patient with that news, the first thing you want to do is get moving, get scheduled. I want to start treatment. We're, let's go, let's go. And um, at the holidays, that's simply not happening. <laughs> so I was really fortunate to have a radi radiation oncologist who called me on Christmas Eve and talked me through everything for one hour. Um, and that just meant the world to me. And it really allowed me to enjoy my holiday with my family, which at the time could have been the very last holiday that I had. So I was really grateful for that. And I will say, kind of uh, to what Nadia is mentioning, is I think you do have to be a strong advocate for yourself. And you know, it's, look, I've been doing this 10 or 11 years now, this whole melanoma game. So it's, I, I received a piece of advice from a research nurse I had in 2016, and Alice Bonds, if you're watching, sorry, I'm not gonna cuss, but um, she told me that the best thing you can do for yourself, she goes, Christina, you just need to be a jerk, which except she didn't say jerk. Um, <laughs> And it was right when, you know, this other nurse was messing up, like, with my veins and all this stuff. And I realized, you know what? She's right. She's absolutely right. You have to take control. No one's going to come in there and rescue you. And if you're like me, I'm a single person doing this all by myself. And you've, you've got to take initiative. And so I learned what that looks like. And if you hear the word no or we can't do that or call again later, I mean, you be persistent, be consistent. Like you're a patient and you have so much value in being that figure on your care team. You are the most important person on your care team. It's you, the patient. And so, <laughs> so I think, you know, use whatever, whatever you think is best. And I, it's like I tell people, the most important thing is that you trust your provider, that you trust your medical team. And you need to have that. And if you don't trust them, then find a different one. This is a shop for value market. So you can fire people and go hire another team. So um, that being said, I've been really fortunate. Um, in my experience, I've had two oncologists really kind of managing my care. Um, the main one I have is Dr. Lipson at Hopkins, and then I have Dr. Talby at MD Anderson. So. I'm sure he's not here, but he already knows there's a shout out. Um, but I'm really lucky that they're friends and that they can sit down over dinner and discuss my case if, if it needs to be that way. And if that's something that you want, then you need to ask for that. And don't feel bad asking for that and wanting that on your medical team. Um, again, you're the biggest player and you're the decision maker. You are the captain of your own ship. And be a jerk. Except not that. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had known you uh, when, <laughs> when my mother was alive because um, it, do, it doesn't come naturally to me. But next to my mother, I was able to do a lot more than I would have done for myself. Um, and she gave me a lot of flack for it too because it wasn't in her nature. So that kind of caused some disruptions in, in our relationship. Of course, later she would say, I know, I know that you had to ask those questions, but I just was embarrassed, you know, or, or whatever. And so we had to come up with a game plan. I mean, this is from the caregiver perspective of coming up with a game plan of discussing what you're gonna discuss, like have a meta conversation about what you're gonna discuss before going in and knowing that it might not go well, not in terms of the answer that you're, I mean, the prognosis wise, but I mean, 
you know, m maybe the appointment will be really delayed and then you'll, you'll have, you know, only 10 minutes with your oncologist or something. You know, things may not go according to plan, but at least you go in with a game plan in terms of what you want to find out at your appointment. Um, when, you know, maybe she wants me to step out of the room at what point or vice versa. She, she, I have a sidebar with the doctor. And then afterwards, we always planned to have a debrief where we would go have, you know, go to a restaurant. No matter what the struggle was, we would somehow get to eat because that was our thing. Um, you know, even if I had to push her in a wheelchair, which I did, she was like, we are going to eat. <laughs> and we would discuss, you know, what was said so that we could both be on the same page. Inevitably, we weren't because two people always hear things differently, and then you have to have a way to sort of follow up with your provider. And Dr. Pavlik taught me that only recently, that some providers actually offer a way to follow up with their patients. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can email me. What? I didn't know that. And so I always went into appointments being so nervous that not only would I not get through my questions, but that I wouldn't understand the answer that I wouldn't be able to write it down fast enough. I wouldn't be able to read my writing afterwards. So now what I try to say in hindsight to other patients and caregivers is record your appointments. Uh, you know, discuss before going in. Email the questions that you might have ahead of time. Some providers might look them over. Some don't want to know what you want to ask and won't answer what you ask and won't want you to follow up because that does exist. Uh, we all have those kinds of struggles in, in healthcare. But many do, and if you propose it, they might be open to it because it will, in the end, make their job easier. So I think having game plans with your care partner uh, really helps, and to be able to follow up and make sure you're on the same page. Yeah, and uh, again, as a provider, I think it's also important to gauge your patient and their caregiver's level of understanding Again, and it's not education level, it's healthcare literacy. It's what do you understand about all these terms that we're using that in our heads are everyday language, like, I don't know, emesis. Okay, go up to a person in the street and ask them if they know what the word emesis means. I guarantee you nobody does. Or like till therapy, I was like, yeah. till, until what? Till, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, and immunotherapy, um, you know, that, that brings us to how do we as providers talk to our patients about treatment options? You know, what is the clinical trial? You know, you were on a clinical trial. I think that's fabulous. I think that should be the first thing out of every oncologist's mouth is we've got this clinical trial and you're eligible. Let's talk about what a clinical trial is. But again, that takes time. So you have to make sure that you've earmarked your enough time for you to talk to your patient about that. Um, and if you're going to talk about immunotherapy, how do you de how do you describe what immunotherapy is to a patient? Um, you know, I think some you know I am a terrible artist, um, but I make stick figures and I make circles, <laughs> um, and. Most people, most people watch TV or watch movies. So I try to use, um, I try to find a movie that people have seen and explain immunotherapy based on the movie. I like to use Independence Day because most people have seen Independence Day. So we explain T cells and cancer cells based on melanoma cells, the alien ship, the fighter pilots are the T cells and how the T cell has to go up there, shoot in the right spot, and then boom, it explodes. And everybody does the, oh, is that how that works? Um, and it's a very simplistic way, but no matter what your level of education, you get it. And that's all that matters is that when patients leave the office, they get what you're going to be trying to do for them. Um, and so you have to sometimes be creative. you know. Pictures work for some people. Um, pictures work for most people. We're using analogies like the movies. Unfortunately, there's some people who don't watch TV at all, and then you're really stuck. Um, and I actually found out there are people in this world who do have never seen Star Wars. <laughs> never, not one. 
And I found out that's my sister-in-law. <laughs> and I was like, what's wrong with you? Um, but you try and find some kind of common ground. Um, and, you, and you go from there. And again, it's very helpful. It opens up that conversation. Because then if patients don't quite understand, um, they can then say, well, if, if my fighter pilot doesn't get in here, what happens? And the answer is pretty much nothing. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Actually, I'd love to hear I, from, from you, Dr. Pavlik. How can patients be better at communicating, and how can caregivers be better at communicating from a doctor's point of view? I mean, we can talk about how we would like clinicians to uh, improve their communication skills, but I don't know how much time we have left, but I'd be curious to hear from a clinician's point of view what you think, because you, you mentioned some, something when we were talking earlier about how caregivers can be really helpful, but they can also be pains in the butt. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of lists. I tell everybody, write it down. Write down your questions, because once you get here, nobody remembers what you wanted to ask me. You've got, whatever, three or four weeks between treatments. You know, have a notepad that you have and you have, and then bring them in, and let's go through them. Um, you know, the wonderful joy of electronic medical records gives you instant access to your doctor 24-7, yay. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, sometimes on Sunday morning I get up with my cup of coffee and there's the four emails of, can you explain? And I'm like, no, I haven't had my coffee yet. Um, I thought I drew it for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it allows me to also put it in writing for them. Because what I thought they may have understood, clearly they didn't understand. And if I could explain it, and, and what you have to keep in mind is when you explain to people, you know, just like an informed consent, you can't talk in language higher than third grade, no matter what degree somebody has, because patients need to understand it, need to throw away that medical jargon, and just answer their question. Well, and I think, too, to your point that when you're discussing your diagnosis or your treatment plan, I mean, you want to get to a solution, get to a path forward. But you're also really overwhelmed <laughs> by this news and that you're there and you're anxious and you're stressed. And I don't know, um, it, anything with mental health, like your, your amygdala, and not to go into medical jargon, is overriding your prefrontal cortex to try and save you. So it's... It's a lot to memorize and remember in the moment. So I do think if you are a patient, then you're seeking um, that next step, you know, after you read news or discussing treatment or even along the way, I, I think you should really not be afraid to seek out appropriate mental health resources to help you deal with that news. I mean, that is so, so important. I know for myself, like I started therapy right when I got diagnosed because I needed to deal with this and to your point, I wrote down all my questions, a list to take into my oncologist. I wrote about 16 questions. And after a while, we realized it was all the same question, just said 16 different ways, which was, am I dying? So, um, and that's my anxiety talking, right? So it's that if there's a more manageable way for me to deal with anxiety and dealing with cancer is depressing, you know? Like it's being depressed or being anxious about what you're dealing with is super normal. So you're not alone, and don't be afraid to be an advocate for your own mental health while you're at it. I mean, your quality of life is, is up to you, and that's one way I think that you can um, really address that head on and just deal with your anxiety. And um, I mean, I, I know I had it, so it wouldn't be normal if you didn't have it, so. No, but I think that is so important, because underlying any diagnosis that's new to someone, there's going to be that apprehension, there's going to be that anxiety, not only in the patient, but in the caregiver. And then sometimes you get the patient and the caregiver whose anxiety feeds off the other one. Mm -hmm. And that's always fun to watch. It's like <laughs> Wimbledon in your office. Um, but, and, and I, I think it's so important. I think now the, the one maybe good thing that came out of the pandemic was that people are not afraid to talk about their mental health anymore. You know, mental health is okay. It's okay to say, and I'm at the breaking point. 
I, I need some help, I need some medicine, it, get me something. Um, whereas pre-pandemic, it was all taboo. You just brushed it under the carpet and I'm just gonna be tough and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna tough through it. And it, it just is such a detriment and it could really be so um, debilitating to patients, to families, to interactions, um, and to treatment, you know. Uh, it. I just wanted to offer um, uh, some, I guess, ad advice, which would be to check with your institution because different institutions have different uh, resources, not just for dealing with mental health, but to help navigate the system. I mean, some are useless, but some are really uh, good. Um, you know, whether it's a social worker, a patient navigator, even psychology or psychiatry, they can help. And they can also help with communication uh, challenges, like help me, help, you know, coach me to advocate for what I want because, you know, I'm having trouble advocating because not everybody is as talented as Christina is to, for example, you know. Just be a jerk. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, no, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that, but you know, it's, it's a skill because you're a communications professional. So in, in a way, it's, it's a skill that not all of us have, and especially not when your life is at stake. You can be good at communications at your job, um, but not good at communicating when your life is on the line and you're trying to develop that sense of trust that Dr. Pavlik was talking about, because in the end, you have to really trust you know, not just your oncologist, but your entire team, which as I said before, can consist of a lot of people. And sometimes people you've never met before coming into the room and you're very vulnerable. And you know, how can you communicate well under those circumstances? It's, it's like, and we don't have a system now that really promotes better communication. As I said, clinicians aren't trained, but check with your institution because a lot of institutions do have programs. I mean, there's a program called Vital Talk. Um, it's an external program that a lot of hospitals use and they put out great content on how clinicians can have difficult conversations, whether it's about end of life, um, you know, treatment transitions, and that content at through the Vital Talk website is also very helpful for patients to see how clinicians are struggling to have these conversations because clinicians are nervous as well. We, we forget that you guys are human beings, but you know, um, it's it's a job. You get to go home at the end of, end of the day, but you have you suffer a lot of moral injury day to day, losing patients. Um, you know, not wanting to have those conversations, having to have conversations that you don't want to have either. So, you know, I think we're all in this together, mm -hmm. and if we try to avail ourselves of the resources that your institutions might have, external programs like Vital Talk, NCI has guidelines on communication that's really interesting. There's a nursing program called Elevate Nurses, I think it's called. That's a very interesting communication program for nurses. I am so sorry to interrupt, but I do want to make sure we have just a couple minutes for some audience questions. Um, I think we have one right here. And Hi. Hi. Um, here's, um, so, you know, we're all patients, caregivers, cancer adjacent advocates um, in this room. Um, and I have a communications question from that perspective. As a patient, right, I have um, the benefit of being familiar with me because I'm me. And so I know what my personality needs are when I'm finding a provider for myself, right? I know what my communication needs are. Now, as an advocate, when a patient comes to me for advice on who should they see, right? If they live in an area that I'm not overly familiar with, my recommendation is going to be the closest, most brilliant key opinion leader. Um, and that's the person I'm going to recommend for them to go to um, when they ask me, right? Now, I have done, I do this a lot, and there is for anecdotal purposes of my question. Um, one in particular where, um, who is brilliant, and every time I recommend them to a patient, the patient calls me crying, because the brilliance and the bedside are not aligned. <laughs> so um, as an advocate, um, what, what advice do you have, you know, as caregivers and patients, advocates, and as a physician, um, how can we as advocates help the patients that we're working with kind of navigate those communication issues? And how do we use our own advocate voices to interact with those brilliant minds to make very respectful suggestions that potentially um, there might be some room for improvement in their communication styles with patients? 
Um, is there anything, because I know that there can be a mentality um, very much of, from the patient side, very much similar to like, I don't want to send my food back, they'll spit in it in the kitchen. You know, it's the same kind of like, I don't want to question my oncologist, my care won't be as good, and I might be dying, and I'm not going to, and I'm not going to be a problem patient, I'm going to be like the easiest, smoothest patient so that my, that I'm assured I'm getting good treatment, when really, the, as we know, <laughs> the smoothest, easiest patient often is not getting the best treatment because they're not advocating for themselves. But, but so I'm just wondering from a physician standpoint and an advocate patient caregiver standpoint, do you have any advice or best practices for helping to use our advocate voices in that regard? How to deal with a, an oncologist that's a jerk. <laughs> Well, he just, he just back, not, right? not, yeah. I mean, when you see them in, in situations like this, then, you know, they're brilliant. This is where they shine, right? So, so this friendly. is what we know as advocates. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will call Christina. I, yeah. <laughs> call me. Um, I, I mean, I guess my inclination is that, first and foremost, the question I would have for the patient is, do you trust this doctor? Because let's take personality out of it, right? It's, it comes to a matter of do you trust them with your care? And that's the most important question is you need to feel confident about the person who is making these recommendations to you. They're not making your decisions for you, but they are making recommendations for you, providing you with options. And you need to feel confident about that. So I think start there. Um, bedside manner, I mean, look, you can't send people to nice school, you know? So it's, you just kind of have to I don't know, this is a growing opportunity for you to get really proactive about your own care. And if you don't like it, if it's not a good fit, then go elsewhere. I mean, we, to Dr. Pavlik's point, like we live in a day and age now where you can hire an oncologist to see you um, across the country and then just have a local clinic manage your day to day. Uh, that's not unusual, tons of people do that. So I think that's a pretty solid option. If, if you just feel like you're, the trust has been broken, you're not getting anywhere, you don't even like this person, then I think it's time to find a new manager. Yeah, you know, I, I when I see a patient for the first time, a lot of times it comes up and they'll say, you know, my family wants me to get a second opinion, almost like it's an insult to me. And it's the family that wants it, not me. Um, and I say, I think that's great. I said, because, you know, all I ask is that you find another doctor who is skilled in melanoma. You know, don't go see the breast cancer doctor for your second opinion, because that's not going to help. Um, but make sure that the expert that you find is a melanoma expert. You know, we, we're all, we all have that knowledge. What you have to find is the person who best, best fits you. And if it's not me, it's, oh, I tell them right there, it is okay. Because not everybody fits my personality. You may get turned on by this other person that you go see and say, yeah, you know, they are much more business-like where, you know, you're just kind of like, go have a beer after, after work with me. Um, because you're too, you're too laid back. Find what fits you and go with it. Make sure you're comfortable with it. Make sure it's the person that you trust with your life. Um, there's no right, there's no wrongs. And just like now that we have Zoom or, you know, people can go get second opinions. You know, many times I work with local docs. I have patients that are in Colorado. I have patients that are all over the country. They'll come in, they'll see me. I'll get on the phone with their local doc. And why do you have to come see me all the time if you can get something closer to home that's exactly what i'd give you in new york city um, and it's building those partnerships and being open to working with local docs community docs because many times people who come into the city come from more rural town smaller towns and they don't have big academic centers that are easy for them to get to so it really is building a nice collaborative practice with a local doc to provide the patient with the best that they can get. And then I tell the patients, when you get your scans, send me the disc. You know, we could do a Zoom chat. You can fly in if you want to see me. You can do whatever you want. But, and then we sit down and we have 
a group think. So your local oncologist, myself, you, we talk about what does the scan show and where, where should we go from here. So I think there's lots of options. Um, I wanted to comment on, um, I guess, how to discuss like issues or problems or side effects. So my sister, I was a caregiver um, with my sister, and she was um, put on Ipi Nevo and was um, really struggling with fatigue, which was a known side effect that they'd told her about. So we go to an appointment and she says, I'm really tired. And they say, yeah, I know, that's, you know, a lot of people are tired. But her fatigue got worse and worse. And I mean, I could hear it in her voice when I would talk to her on the phone. Like she just, it was too much an effort to even really talk. She, she said, when I'm trying to move laundry from the washer to the dryer, I have to sit two times and rest. Like I can't, you know, when I go upstairs, I, I, I can't get all the way up the stairs without taking a couple of breaks and sitting on the stairs. And so we go back for her next appointment and she's like, I'm just really, really tired. And they were kind of like, well, yeah, that's, that's understood. And then I chimed in and I said, no, no, no. She, she doesn't even have the energy to put an entire load of laundry from the washer to the dryer. She can't even get up the stairs without taking a couple of breaks. At which point the oncologist said, oh, that's a different story. And so I think what that, and then it turns out she had adrenal insufficiency. Mm -hmm. And so then a couple years later, my brother is dealing with mesothelioma and he was also on Ipinibo and my sister-in-law said, oh my gosh, he's hardly gotten out of bed for two weeks. I tried to get him to go walk the dog with me. He got like in front of the house and had to turn around and go back because he couldn't, you know, he got to the sidewalk and couldn't go any further. And I said, you need to take that to his doctor because that's not right. And that's what happened to Busy, my, our sister. And so I think it's important when, when you're discussing problems, if they don't see, if it's, mm -hmm. if it's something that's so like affecting your life yeah. and they don't seem to be responding, you need to keep pushing and saying, no, 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 this is not just, I need more naps. This is life altering. And so I don't know what, what you think about that or how, how do you encourage a doctor to <laughs> Yeah, this, this happened attention. to me uh, as well. Um, the fatigue is the pits. Like, it is terrible. And so I think what I'm hearing you say is that you and your sister didn't, you didn't feel heard. Right. You did not feel like they were listening. And I think that is a problem. And so I think you do need to spell it out for them sometimes because I think, and Dr. Pavel can probably speak to this a little bit better, I mean, I find that doctors hear patients all day, multiple times a day. They're getting emails, my chart. I mean, some of them give out their texts, you know, their mobile phone numbers, God bless them. But it's just, it's a lot. And so I think sometimes there can be some fatigue, you know, on their end. And so I think when you incorporate that, you still have to make sure, like, your case is the most important case to you. And so you need to really help them understand. Uh, for myself, I had the same exact fatigue situation, um, and it was it's brutal. Like there's no way, there's no two ways about it. Um, I think at that point, that's where you have to start discussing what are the what are the options for me right now with this. This fatigue is crippling. It's compromising my quality of life, and that's not acceptable to me. Um, for myself, that looked like prednisone, which if you're in this room, you probably know exactly what that is, and it's the worst drug ever to get the moon face and the whole nine yards. And so um, I think, you know, you just have to be willing to look at other opportunities or alternatives if you're on treatment and you're experiencing crippling fatigue. At minimum, you should be asking your doctor, what are my options? Here's what I'm experiencing. Here's how it's impacting my day-to-day -day life. And what can we do about it? And if that answer is nothing, then yeah, I think you're in the market for a second opinion at that point. There is a, uh, a podcast that uh, MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering, puts out. And they did a podcast when one of, for interviewing one of the oncologists who was diagnosed with cancer. And one of the most memorable quotes um, in that podcast was, the 
uh, my calculus as a patient changed from that of my math when I was an oncologist, and I realized that the the patient's calculus is different um, than a clinician's, and it's so true. So when clinicians talk about side effects and you know the sexy clinical trials readouts and yeah side effect this adverse events AEs or whatever. It's really different when it's your life at stake and you have to do the laundry and you have to take care of your kid and you have all of these things to do and you may not you know, want to take on some of these things that are quality of life issues because it's your math and you know, a fatigue could be a symptom of another much more serious mm -hmm. adverse event that they are, should know and if they don't, then it's up to you but you know, you're told that you're, it's normal to be tired. That's where a caregiver maybe perspective comes in and you're like, wait a minute, you know, I see something changing or not getting better or something like that. So yeah, when in doubt, just report it. And if you aren't being heard, I mean, there should be maybe other people on the team like a clinical trial nurse or, you know, just a nurse who's sort of more attuned to taking, uh, you know, calls about side effects or who encourages calls about side effects. But I mean, when in doubt, just report it to make sure that you're doing your own due diligence because you could miss something that will set you back um, if you don't report it. I yeah, guess. and at least from a caregiver standpoint, I think when a patient tells us a symptom, that should automatically be followed by an open-ended question. So tell me about this fatigue. Because I think in our heads, we hear fatigue, and it's like, yeah, I'm fatigued too, but you know, nobody cares, <laughs> nobody asks me. Um, but the fatigue, you're absolutely right. So many times, adrenal insufficiency walks in the door, and if you don't ask the right questions, that adrenal insufficiency patient's gonna walk right out the door. Thank you, and I am so sorry to have to be the one to end this conversation. Uh, I, I, I'm confident that we could all talk about this for the rest of the afternoon. Um, I'm looking at our panel.